My name is uh, Kevin Tidball, and I'm a director in IT at Shelter Insurance. And we're here to talk about how we have transformed Shelter into a more productive unit to deliver value to the business. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm Taval Panchal. Um, I'm the external coach. I work with Agile 42. And in this uh, journey, what I want to capture and what we want to share is our personal uh, stories and struggles as we went through this transformation at Shelter Insurance. And uh, to kind of give you a taste of where we are, I want to show the start and the end state. So if you look at where we started, this is for a spin-off for a completely new insurance company. This is back in October 2016 when I would liken this to planting seeds about something called this visual management of all the work and a very large program that involved a few, a couple of agile teams and many resource pools. And to wish that we can turn all the resource pools into uh, agile teams is not practical in the short amount of time and the state at which we were in. Do you like to kind of describe a little bit of where we are? Like if you look at where we went to, uh, we started right next to a garbage can, right? <laughs> literally. Yeah, literally. This is right next to a garbage can. And if we go to where we are today. Actually, this photo that I'm going to show is about, and one more, is about a month old. And uh, things have changed a lot, even in the last uh, month, right? And for us, uh, this has been more like a journey where we didn't have a destination in our mind. We didn't know like exactly how everything is going to look like. But in preparing for the presentation, I asked Kevin what character from Lord of the Rings he's going to be. And he said he'll be Samwise Gamgee, which also happens to be my pick. So I'm more curious about why he picked himself to be Samwise in this journey. Uh, I definitely don't think I'm the, uh, the wise wizard of the bunch, nor do I have you know, a lot of skills and experience, but uh, you know, I'm gonna I do my best to to help um, to, to to help with the journey to get us there. Uh, I can't do it all. Um, I really can't do much of anything, but I will do my best. Yeah, and for me, I felt more like Sam because this was not my burden to carry. Uh, the best I could do is provide the service to the organization and it is their burden to take it from wherever they are. So as we present, a lot of this is probably a little bit of work from my side, but a huge amount of heavy lifting that has been done by many people at this company. So I don't want to discount all the work that everyone else did. We just happen to be standing here in front of you with some pictures to share. Now, all beginnings, I think, have a beginning. In the sense, I want to give you a little bit of a sense about how we started engaging with this company at the very, very uh, beginning. So if we flip around uh, this section, I want to talk about uh, the identity of this company. It's an insurance company. Uh, us building credibility, building trust, uh, showing competence, and planting seeds. As that's the general theme that I want to go over in this. Uh, when we started at the at shelter, right? right? We were asked to help out with a few agile teams. Yeah, we, uh, we knew we were going to do something new and different, uh, especially for a 60-year-old insurance company that has been doing things the same way for the past 60 years. Uh, so we did an assessment of where are we as an organization and how are we going to get to where we're wanting to go. Uh, so we had a vision from our executives of start a new direct-to-consumer business. Um, strategy, it was all there, but then the right half of the screen kind of mirrors where we were. Very management-centric. Um, our management was intimately involved in everything we do. We have teams. They're in silos, they, they do what they do, and they do it somewhat efficiently. Um, you know, skills, experiences within the teams, um, it's a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. Um, there really wasn't any overflowing need to pull everybody together. Everybody just did their own thing, and, and that was okay. Um, there were some strong individuals holding up some strong products. They would get tired. They would walk out the door, and that's okay. We would 
put the next person in there and he would pick up the truck and on the road we would go. Yeah. Uh, the reason when we started our engagement, we, in this uh, picture we're using the Scott Martin model of uh, understanding the business alignment. As an external coach, it is very important for us to understand what is the current context even before you step in to start providing and advising and recommending to people. In this particular case, it was also a way for us to in some ways, they say, we know what you know. Like we, we can see what our strengths and weaknesses are. And there is an acknowledgment at this point between the two parties. One of our challenges, right, as we go through this, we've been involved in this for almost a year now. And there is so much like we could spend like, yeah, we could spend a whole day talking about all the nuances. But I want to give you a general flavor of how we started. We paid attention to understanding what is the culture in this organization. In this case, we are using the Schneider model as a way to understand and use that model to portray where does most of the culture in this organization falls. When you see certain teams, a few are on the cultivation side. Those are the agile teams represented. But the majority of the organization is more of a control culture, which is to be expected from a company that works in an insurance world with a lot of regulations and insurance i would say generally risk covers yes conservative by nature yeah never know when that next storm is going to come so as we work through that uh our challenge from that point on is to build a fellowship of some kind and i'm trying to carry on with the lord of the rings metaphor as long as it can right uh, for this fellowship we needed an idea to understand how big uh, the scope of our engagement is going to be at Agile 42, these are a lot of tools that we use as we work with our organizations to help them go through the transformation journey. One of the tools that's publicly available on Creative Commons is called the strategy mapping. And to kind of give you a sense of what this is, it essentially captures why do we want to do what we want to do. So at the core is the goal. How are we going to go about doing this? Which is essentially talking about the conditions that we need to have, success factors we need to create, and how am I going to, what do we need to do so we have these necessary conditions in place. I'm trying to keep a very high level at the strategy map because this is not about how you do this, but I think I'm overlaying the Simon Sinek's uh, start with the why talk for you to kind of get a sense of, it is very important to build a sense of purpose behind the people who are going to be helping in this transition. This is in Kevin's room, right? It's this is in my office. office, yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about what this is? Yeah, so um, back to the Schneider model, we are conservative by nature, we are controlling by nature, and we're doing something different. We have our strategy map that says how we're gonna get there. This is our Agile Champions Kanban board that we set forth to how can we facilitate this transition? So we purposely put some coaches in with the business, in with some, some technical folks, uh, quality assurance. They're all part of this, how do we transition to Agile and what work needs to be done? Um, so we set up this organization of this is how we're gonna facilitate this transformation before we go start and doing work. So this board is that progress towards achieving that strategy map that was shown in the previous slide. Yep. And the membership is around seven or eight people, right? They all fit in your room, yep. but a few people have moved in and out. Yep. But overall, the transition team hasn't seen a lot of flux in the sense the core membership is still uh, the same with one or two people moving in and out of this group. Now, the direct initiative, and I think you are best able to describe this entire complexity. Right. right, so we put together our strategy map of how do we do Agile. We then focused on the, the initiative at hand, and we started gathering scope and, and looking at what all has to be done, and it's huge. Um, it impacts um, most every facet of our organization. So this is a synopsis of we have some agile teams over on the left, some vendors, some legacy managed resource pools. They're all impacted. They're all going to have a role to play to deliver this direct initiative. So we've set up these teams. 
they begin to work, they begin to collect their stories, collect their requirements, everybody's working to achieve a goal. Easy, right? Yeah, and uh, the constraint that the organization had is you're going to build uh, this new company using the same people that are now part of running the mutual business, which is a completely different way of doing work. When you move away from mutual, like you have agents who go sell insurance to putting it on a website where people can come and buy insurance. So organizationally, there are resource pools that are focused on doing production support, uh, building new features for existing mutual line of business, but at the same time, they are contributing towards building this new company. So it's sort of like a very weird intersection. Yeah. I wish like everything was nice and neat to be organized, but it wasn't that way. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of challenges as we started. I think to summarize it, it would mean like everyone was busy, it was nothing was getting done. Yeah, it felt like everyone was working on something, but if you ask inside the company, where are we with this particular initiative, there was a huge question mark around yeah. it. Absolutely. Now, to kind of go into some of the details over here, I think my favorite is the date polling reporting mechanism. I'm sure some project managers will recognize this meeting where you have a, a main project manager or the lead project manager and a lot of resource managers and other people coming in and providing a date. When will you be done? They'll provide a date, and that date will imply whether you're red, green, or yellow. And this was how primarily the status of the entire program was being run, purely as a verbal survey of people, not on basis of any kind of empirical evidence, but mostly based on, so what do you think and where you are? And sometimes you would not get real data. You would get some information so you can buy time to fix the problem before you declare it to be read in your PM style meeting. Now, as we started working over here, I think an operating mantra that we agreed on, and I, that's what was used as a guiding light for us to steer this entire effort was to say that we want to work on the right things at the right time with the right people. And the step one to this was going to be visualization about what work is happening. So when we started, we created this big giant boat, but it was a huge empty, right? Everyone's working, there are a lot of people. How many people would be, would you say, in number of? 100 or so. 100 or so yeah. people working. So as this board's going on, we're still having our project management meetings, and how's it going? It's going good. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, and, and th that was a challenge, like we found a room, we, they have huge printers and it was awesome to put the board together, but then no work was showing up onto this board. So what we did is, uh, we did a session, uh, the intention of the session to turn it into a game. We turned it into a puzzle game where we got people into a room and we divided it into two separate groups and we started to engage them emotionally first, asking them if you were part of this program and you wanted to know where this is at, what pieces of information would you be looking for? So there's one group that is creating a quiz, and the other group is going to the program area to go look at the board, and as they come back, they have to answer the questions that the first group created, right? And then they get to score each other. So by turning this into a competitive style activity and a learning exercise, we built a lot of familiarity with the board, because when you put something that big in a company, the first feeling that people have is a fear, like this is huge, like this is different. This is not what I've done before and it is alien to me. So I, we wanted to build some degree of comfort level with something like this and we started to gamify some of the work that we were doing in terms of socializing this board. Absolutely. Now, <clears throat> I think you could help us with the power of legitimacy and the state in which the requirements were. Yeah, so some of the, the information that we learned out of our uh, uh, out of our reflection was we're not entirely sure what we're supposed to be doing. Um, so we brought in some experts, um, some subject matter experts, and they helped it from a user perspective, from a consumer perspective, lay down some, some acceptance. And we, we just called them user acceptance plans. And they, at a high level, would say this is the process that I'm trying to do and this is a, a feature within the process and, and here is a, a, a group of work that's going to be accomplished to, to meet that feature. 
Um, and that was our first vision into what is it really that we're trying to do. Um, and yeah. that, was, that was just a, a first step. And yeah. we, we got it from our reflection, from our, from, our, from our game that we played. Yeah, Shelter is based in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, it's a university town and it's a very small town. People at Shelter have stayed together for a long, long time. Yeah? So the choice of selecting the legitimate, I, I think the power of legitimacy was huge because the subject matter expert had an inherent, uh, how do you call it, a credibility in the rest of the organization as someone who knows how to run an insurance business. So that was like a stroke of thing where the management pulled the right person in to set the boundary of what should we be building. Now, when we start over here, we got a work in progress board and a UAT skeleton that we talked about. And I'm putting this picture up there for you to kind of see the progression of how we went from almost like an empty board to slowly building our visualizations. Now, as part of understanding what capacity do we have, it is very tempting to kind of look and see and go uh, minutely measure every single team or resource pool's output, but that would have been too time consuming from just a reporting standpoint. If the cost of collecting the measure outweighs the benefit, then there's no point in collecting that measure. So what we decided is to use a very simple freeway analogy is if you were to put a chair next to an exit on a freeway, if you counted the number of cars that made it through the exit, you could reasonably well predict how many more cars will show up in the next week. It's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be good enough. And also it's going to act as a very simple training set for the person uh, who was managing the big visual board. Because remember, they have not had an experience with an agile approach. So we wanted to keep the measure so simple that you could do it without thinking too much about it. So the team members, they had a responsibility to put a date when a item moved towards the right. And when it passed a certain column, the project manager who was looking at the board would have to go and build a burn up shot. Yeah, v very simple. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get there, yeah. But this is like the very simple measure that we wanted to put in place rather than go complicated uh, at first. Now, another uh, notion that helped, and this was very helpful for traditional uh, folks because they looked at this big direct initiative as a big bang release that went out and we were now going to do stuff. We started using this notion of a release candidate and the metaphor of the geese over here is to imply that when they were putting geese back in the wild in some documentary, a couple of project managers that they saw together at some point, they said, uh, it's a release candidate. We don't know if it's going to fly. Yeah. So that was a good metaphor to play with in our heads as a way to build buy-in towards smaller chunks of functionality. And we set our goal for these to be meaningful for the business, not just technically. Yeah, we took our, uh, our user acceptance uh, grid that we had and we just basically chunked it up into manageable pieces. Uh, one of the things that we were seeing is the teams would get distracted looking ahead or looking beyond what we would like for them to focus on. So these release candidates kind of put those guardrails in place to say, focus on this. Well, that doesn't make sense. That's okay. It may or may not fly. It doesn't matter. Focus on this and get this done first. Yeah, some of the challenges that we noticed were there were really passionate people about building this new insurance company, super excited about this feature that no one else has, but that goes way beyond into the future. First, you want to be a legally valid insurance company before you make all the fancy features. But most of the teams are trying to run and gold plate on that side as opposed to standing up a basic insurance company. So that was the guardrail stuff that helped even the product owners to work on it. This purpose of the single page roadmap was primarily for Kevin and his peers to have a meaningful discussion with the sea level in terms of where are we headed. Absolutely. This is another way that we use to put uh, those measures in place and to, to communicate our progress being made as the project, the program as a whole. Um, and it just uh, allowed us to <clears throat> break those down, keep people focused, but also use our our, our measures to show progress. Now, when, we, when I planted the seed that we need a one page, 
a single page that will guide the effort for 100 people on this particular F on this thing. Uh, I was asked for how do you give me an example of the roadmap. So I gave my example, which is the perfect example. It's awesome. But then they did not take it. And they created something that was their own. That was a huge learning experience for me, is I can't just provide uh, advice just like that. For me, I need to be able to dance with my clients in many ways. So we sat together and we wireframed what could a roadmap look like. Based on that wireframe, we got a lot of engagement from people. And from this point onwards, uh, the roadmap template, the way they are managing and visualizing and providing the direction to the rest of the company has continued to evolve. This is the latest version of the roadmap, but th this is not the latest version. The latest version is now maintained on an online tool, which I didn't have time to put in the presentation slide. But the trick here is to continue to iterate and never settle on any one particular way of representing, because as the business objectives change, you also need to change your visualization and how people view it. Yeah, this is just an example of start someplace, what if, experiment, evolve, mature, receive feedback, and, and move on. Yeah. A thing that we wanted to make sure was we understood that we are prioritizing for business outcome as opposed to prioritizing for features. What, what I mean by that is in our roadmap, it was very important that we all were on the same page. And that meant like we needed a two line, no more than two lines about what this release candidate is about, what's the intent with this particular release candidate. If we agree on the intent, then we can have a meaningful discussion about the features that we want to put in this release candidate. If we don't agree on the intent, then we are going to spend a lot of time in meetings without trying to understand what we're really trying to achieve here. And if you notice, even the intent kind of shifted. When we started, at first there was RC0 and then RC1, and then they introduced RC, Q, and P in the middle. Then that moved into managing our vendors because there was a huge cost to keep the vendors on standby as we are building the rest of the features. So the release candidate shifted in our intent. That's the RC0 that you see on the pink one over here. <clears throat> this is probably what you were asking about. Could you walk us through this room a little bit? Absolutely. Over on the left is our roadmap, our one-page one roadmap. <laughs> From there, um, we break that down into the priority, and you can see the flow. Um, but this middle column is actually uh, really important. Impediments. What's holding us up? What's blocking us? Um, at number three there, uh, what are our explicit procedures? What is our definitions of done? What's ready? Um, and these, all of these things uh, we've learned, uh, but they are critically important to the success that we've had thus far. Number four, our metrics. You know, what is our rate of flow? Um, how many cars are, are flying by us on a given day? Which gives us um, insight into what's going to happen next. Now, one of the key things was to start developing organizational habit because the organization, and I hope you won't punch me, but there is a habit of having meetings at the company, right? So there are these uh, little habits that the organization has developed over a long period of time. And one of my uh, things to do as a coach was to start help trigger new habits. And a book that I read uh, from Charles Duhigg, The Power of Habit, was essentially focusing on identify the routine, isolate the cue, and experiment with rewards. It's a huge mystery who did this at this company. But right next to the program boat, there is this box of take five, which is empty now, and someone else put a new one. But what they did in many ways was isolate uh, the, the cue, which is I'm hungry. And then they change the routine. Rather than just taking a bar, when you take it, you must leave a note of appreciation for somebody else in the company or in the program. And by that, they are creating this habit appreciation loop within the system. Because you can imagine this can be very, very troubling for a lot of people who are trying to make the shift. I still don't know who did this, but this was like a good example for me to share with you, right? Now, another habit that we focused on developing was this habit of continuous improvement. And 
this is sort of a, the guiding philosophy with which my peers at Agile 42 we kind of look at is trying to ask somebody to change their actions hoping that you get a better result has never worked. What rather works is you provide an experience that fundamentally changes their belief system and then the actions will come on their own and then you'll get the results. Most of the coaching that we do is intended to provide this positive experience for people. So we start fundamentally shifting their belief system. To provide you a very little nugget, in the PMO style meeting, when people were going and giving dates of when their particular part of work will be done, overall resulting that the program will be delivered much, much sooner. I ran around in the company and individually talking to people taking $10 bets. Yeah? Are you willing to bet $10 that the entire program will be delivered on the end date that we just agreed on in the meeting? And one lady told me I would not bet a handful of soil from my farm, right? And, and this is where like, we look at how individually no one believes in the end date, but collectively we've agreed on the end date, yeah? So to start planting seeds around questioning what we do at an organization level and to build that experience of like relating it to themselves was important in this particular effort. As we went through this, we started doing retrospectives and this is some of the outcome that came from our monthly retrospectives over here. Today, the retrospectives are being run by themselves as opposed to me facilitating the retrospective with some of the internal coaches. It's primarily run by the project manager who's helping with the board. At one point during our retrospectives, we started to look at and do a focus retrospective in terms of what are our impediments and what's the severity of these impediments. So kind of create a bubble chart of sort where majority of the items that are high severity and high frequency, they are the ones where Kevin and his leadership team need to pay the most attention to because this is beyond the scope and budget authority of the individual teams and project managers. But if something that is of high frequency, but the impact is low for now, could be a future indicator of big problems showing up, right? So these were some of the things that we did in a way to kind of understand like where the program is headed and what is blocking us from making progress. So continuously improve. We, 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 we bought into that uh, up until the point of it seems very chaotic at times. And coming from a culture of you know, consistency and conservative, it's been amazing to me to see the adaptation that our teams have done. Um, one of the, some of the things that we've done is we've, we've learned that being uh, such a large project in many teams, we communicate and integrate and uh, we need to manage our connections and dependencies well. So they've came up with a, a way of, in one of the stand-ups to say, okay, this is what I'm doing that impacts somebody else and somebody else is impacting me and they, they, they scrum around that. Um, the delivery board has evolved. Um, it's went from big charts, big notes to small notes with very little information on them and if you need to know more information, go see somebody else. So. It's just amazing to see the, the, the improvements that have been made. I mentioned the, the release candidates, the definitions of those. I mean, they've, they've almost become questions of, is this part of that or do we worry about it later? And it's just, it's just amazing to see how that will lead and guide the teams in the right directions at the right time. Yeah, the integration dependency management, uh, Mike, if you could raise your hand, yeah. So Mike, along with Amanda, was a part of uh, taking that initiative in the retrospective to first come up with a straw man of how we would manage our integration and dependencies, and then pulling the rest of the members in to help them refine. So it could be put into practice every week. Also, what we found was even though the room was really, really small, uh, because we were learning how we are working together, we never had a final, final visualization. In fact, one part of the wall was always a pilot of the next visualization board coming in, primarily because you have work that is in flight right now, and we can't deal with that many posters. So if there is any future work coming that gets piloted on the next version, and when work from one version is over, you just slide the big Thing onto the side. So you're continuously improving the visualization techniques as the program and its needs are evolving, which is sort of, 
I thought that was really, really cool of how they continue to do that even today. Our biggest challenge was probably adherence to the explicit policies. Uh, when we have 100 people, some of them are agile teams, other people come from traditional resource pools. Um, we had very low confidence that when we put something in the definition of done, or when we put like this is ready for functional testing and these are our expectations in terms of the environment, that it will actually be followed. Yeah, th this came out of some of our retrospectives and uh, you know, our dependency matrix that we talked about, this is, you can go and see who you are impacting. You don't have to guess or know. Um, the, the information is there for, for everybody to see. The policies, um, th this is very key um, to some of the other things we're doing as far as quality. One of the things that we've noticed, uh, we'll speak to, uh, I think it's on the next slide, yeah, the is uh, how do we know that we're making progress. We have our metrics, things are flowing by, but is it truly what we expect? Um, and this helps us with defining what is it that we expect. So therefore, test early, test often, uh, you know, bring the pain. Let me know what's going on. Did our first round of testing? Yeah, we know what's going on. It ain't good. In what? fact, the way the first round of testing happened was uh, when they declared the date that we are going to do a first level functional test pass on the entire product as it exists in a production-like environment. It was a mo almost a month before that date that everyone started expressing that we will not have anything ready for testing. Yeah, And uh, the, the stroke of genius, I think, or the... I think the good part from Kevin and from the leadership was to say, it doesn't matter, that's the entire point of testing is to find out what is broken. So if it is incomplete, we will run through our test pass and we will mark it as incomplete. But being able to run it on time, it was only pushed by a few days. Yeah, yeah but it happened, yeah? And when it happened, uh, discovered a lot of issues. One of the first issues we discovered was there is a complete misunderstanding in our testing strategy. While the teams were understanding they were going to test up until one point, the functional testers were expected. And by functional tester, these are people who are going to use the system as an end user running through about 10 to 20% of the scenario, not doing a full deep dive test on the entire application. There was a huge gap in the kind of testing that was not happening, right? And we were able to identify a lot of issues with the way we were capturing our epics and expressing them, the way meetings were being run in order to communicate the epics to the delivery teams because there was a huge gap in that. So by doing a full test pass, we kind of learn how long it takes to do a full test pass and what is broken. Like, let's find out that bad news today as early as possible so you can do something about it. Yeah, so we went through that learning experience and along comes test number two. Some of the same problems, the test is coming, we're gonna test, are you guys ready? Yeah, we've learned, we've got this. You know, smiley shades, it's all good. <laughs> no, not, not quite, still got problems, but they're not that bad. We had small gaps, what have we learned? What can we do next? Those are all the questions that, that we ask ourselves as we're going through this. So. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the only way we felt we could express it is a range of emoticons because when the second test pass went through, everyone was going through this whole uh, different sense of emotions. I think a good thing that came about with the second round is now we are not doing, at least we are learning how to do small size functional testing as opposed to doing big batch functional testing. Yeah, It's a small incremental step towards a larger purpose of being able to test all the time, but it's going to take effort. Now, there were a lot of activities that were going on. My favorite was that we removed the red, green, yellow PM status meetings. And then there were a lot of activities that I think you're best suited to describe. Yeah, so we try to communicate to the teams, to the executive sponsors, and we've come up with a theme. We've tried to minimize this. We've tried to cut it as much as we can. Uh, you know, it, it starts with, you know, a, a very small core group of, of leaders that are on the floor and and have their finger on the pulse. Um, we meet once a week 
from there, we go into a, a, a pre-planning um, with some very key stakeholders from a business perspective. And we'll take the outcome of that pre-planning into a program planning. Um, once a week, we meet with all of the, the program owners, um, product owners, and we will plan of where are we at and where are we going. And it allows them to, on their cadence, whether it be legacy or scrum or Kanban teams, to make their plan and also know how they're impacting other people. We, we scrum at the, at the program board uh, twice a week, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and we've even cut out a Tuesday meeting based upon, we're for meeting for planning and, and our daily, our weekly stand up now. Um, there's no need to do that twice a week. Get the technical folks together, get the business stakeholders, maybe not just the product owners, but everybody that's impacted by what we're doing, get them together, communicate to the executives, and keep it simple, keep it short, keep it sweet. Yeah. Uh, one of the other aspects is a monthly software demo and where the team started initially was to do uh, a demo of whatever they had produced, right? And that was a good habit forming exercise for people to feel comfortable and being able to showcase what they are doing. But then later the expectations from the demo started shifting in terms of understanding what is it that we are delivering at an epic level which a business person will understand as opposed to a small uh, user story level. And now I recently learned your CEO was in the demo. Yep, he showed up um, and just very interested in what's going on. Um, there's been some demos that we'll have where the teams come and say, well, there's no need to have a demo. There's nothing to show. It doesn't work. But so we still have a demo. We still have a demo. And the answer is we don't have anything to show. But why? And we'll, we'll open up that, that path of communication. So. Very interesting. Yeah. I mean, looking ahead, uh, the company is not yet launched, right? It'll hopefully happen soon. And uh, I think as part of this journey, uh, by engaging with uh, the people who are trying to provide an update on the program and manage the program at that level, I think we have triggered a domino effect. One of uh, the coach that the Agile Champion uh, person, like the, the coach Douglas has on his desk, is uh, change is hard because people overestimate the value of what they have and underestimate the value of what they may gain by giving that up. I think that's been like sort of our coaching mindset all along is you have to acknowledge that people who are working the way they are working, they value a lot of the way that things are, even though they may be dissatisfied with it. And you kind of want to build a, a positive uh, momentum, build an experience for the folks so they want to move to the next state. What we applied over here was more around looking at how we approach our agile transitions at a large scale, where we consciously start with an assessment in terms of understanding the culture, understanding the mindset, understanding the identity of the client, then moving into jointly developing a strategy and rolling out small little experiments that may not seem to be much at first, but over time, these little experiments, I like to call them as not reject experiments. In other words, they just work for as long as they work and they are soon to be rejected for something else because there is no perfect experiment that you can ever run. And based on these non-reject experiments, which we call pilots, uh, we are able to then understand how might we be able to roll this out in a broader scope rather than diving into with both feet in a big organization. A thing that has happened now is uh, Kevin and his uh, peers have redefined the role of a manager. Yeah, talking about you know the the doing our experiments. Well, agile in itself um, is a an experiment at Shelter, and some of the things that we've learned is what is the role of a manager. Um, back to you know our 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 start state of management was integral to our existing culture, and how do we change that? So we've looked into. You know, managers aren't there to make business decisions. They're not there to make technical decisions. They're not there to tell people what they should be working on and when. Um, and that was definitely a challenge, and it still is a challenge. You know, what are they there for? And changing their role just as much as it is changing the team members is, is, 
it's a it's a start. So, right, and a couple of other things that have been triggered is uh, they have developed an internal coaching competency in terms of coaches internally have been formally recognized and acknowledged for the service they provide to the rest of the organization. And also they've started to move into this open area, right? Which was actually in motion long time ago, but it finally all came to conclusion this January where many people are now in the complaining phase because they moved to the open space, right? It's always, I hate it, I'm okay with it, I can't live without it, so. Um, that's, that's pretty much us. Uh, we try to keep it short and sweet because we could go and do a deep dive into a lot of things and I wanted to open this up for some questions if you have and one of us uh, might be able to answer it for you. Mm -hmm. What was your biggest, if there was any focal point of resistance, whether it's passive or active, you could point to a cohort in the organization uh, where kind of the antibodies flared up and what did you do to counteract that? Uh, uh, probably our biggest challenge was just that adoption of change. Uh, there were some people that, you know, we've done it this way for so long and this is how we do business and we're still, attached and our priority is still to keep this existing business up and operational that we're not going to change. Um, we're not going to do things differently. Um, you know, I need nine months of requirements gathered before I can start working. Um, so uh, operational infrastructural type of things of how do you facilitate, you know, a quick turnaround, quick iterations. Um, that's kind of been our biggest challenge. I think from the way I look at it, and it's correct, I have noticed a very subtle movement uh, towards goodness, yeah? Because in the sense, like, when uh, traditional PA project managers, when they were talking to us at the first time, they would say, this visualization thing, this is not going to work. How are we going to put so much work on top of it? And then after three months, uh, they said, that visualization is okay, but this is not going to work. So there's always something or the other that is not going to work, but over time, they're building confidence over the other stuff. So the resistance is constantly shifting. And sometimes it slides back because there's always this time pressure and all other pressures related with launching a company where there's always that seed in your head, like if only we did it classic PM style. Right? So that seed is always going to be there. It's just that the conversation is now slowly, slowly inching away from that. And that's the sh shift that I'm, I am seeing. As I go like every two, I go for about two or three days every month, right? So I can see that difference. So I have to sometimes highlight like, hey, this is all that has changed. But for Kevin and his team, they're all in it all the time. Yeah, this wasn't a, you know, a do or die type of transition uh, that I've you know, heard some of the other, um, some of my other peers here at the conference say that, hey, we had to do this. We didn't have to do this at Shelter. We didn't have to, we could have continued to do business and develop things the way we've always done them. And people don't necessarily see that it's better. Uh, so we've gotten very good at asking the question, what's the worst that could happen? And is, is that really that bad? Or what if we did this? Or can you at least try? <laughs> um, and, and just getting people engaged and giving it uh, a try has it, been, been a challenge. Yeah. Hi. I had two questions, but probably one of you already answered, which is the change behavior on the business side of people. And the other question that I had was, you were displaying the different uh, impediments mm -hmm. that you had on the board. And uh, where, what did you do with the, the, those organizational impediments that is outside the, the boundaries of the team? How do you deal with that, if you had an example? Yeah. So impediments um, that reside outside the boundaries of the team, it really is everybody's a team. We, do, we have this concept of they're separate teams, but there's also this other team that pulls all the teams together. So if a team can't handle something themselves, they'll escalate it to the next team, which then has organizational help to solve that problem across teams. So that was a kind of a layer, that leadership layer um, that we've interjected into 
this coordination that seems to have really helped with those cross team issues. And that has been some of our biggest issue is, well, I'm waiting on him or I'm impacting him or he impacted me. <laughs> um, and, and those have been some, some, some very uh, strong concerns uh, that, that the teams have had to express and escalate and we get resolved. Um, uh, the business uh, community um, overwhelmingly embraces this. They see the struggles that we've had from a service delivery perspective and they envision something better. So when we ask for their commitment to help, they unanimously say, I'll do the best I can with what I have. I already have a full-time job, but I'll help. <laughs> and it, it, that's been, you know, if anything, a saving grace in a lot of this. Um, because if, if they were to resist and the teams were to resist, it would have been probably insurmountable. Um, you mentioned the managers previously. Did you stay with functional managers or did you put managers over teams? We have managers over teams for 90% of our teams. We have formed some new teams, some DevOps teams that pull people from different teams and we haven't reorganized those at this point in time. Um, we have moved into some shared resource concepts of pulling DBAs into the team, but they still report through their functional DBA manager infrastructural operational type things kind of become shared resources within the teams. Um, but in general, we were, we were organized fairly um, in alignment with the business before we were just doing things legacy. One of the things that we continue to be challenged with in the business community is being as incremental as we can versus building this really big RC, right? Are you challenged with that? And what are some of the techniques that you use to get through that? Absolutely. Um, at the program level as well as at the team level, we've kind of formed this um, triad of leadership between business, the technical side, and the glue or the process that, that holds everything together. So we have had this negotiation. Um, the business says, I want this. But they don't realize that this is this. So we'll come back and we'll say, well, what if we do this first? Does that have value to me? Oh, that doesn't have value to me. Well, what about this? And we, we try to scope it as small as we can from a technical implementation perspective and have that conversation with the business. And sometimes they say, I don't understand, but if it helps you, I'm all right with it. Um, and sometimes they say, that makes perfect sense. Or what about this instead of that? And we'll do this and then we'll do that. And it's, it really is, um, has become uh, comical at times between the negotiation between what can we do and what's realistic and how do you chunk things up to show continued progress? Um, and they, the business sees that as value of, I have something, it may not fly, but at least it's an egg. And you sit on it long enough and it hatches and someday it may fly. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and that, that, that process is, is it's, it's, it's uh, been great. Just one last comment on it. Uh, Prioritizing the features doesn't help. Uh, prioritizing business outcomes is a lot more valuable. So by articulating our release candidate intent, uh, we took away the conversation from, will I have my favorite feature to what business outcome do we need? And when you look at business outcomes, you realize that there's a very few features that often are needed to satisfy one business outcome. So that was a shift that we started to make with the uh, intent for release candidates in the roadmap. I thought it was really interesting that you said that you take bets and that individually people don't believe in end dates, but collectively they all agree. So what exact, what was the form? What exactly, how exactly did you handle that? Did you go back to the group with the teams and the business folks together? Did you negotiate the dates all over again? Um, I mean, what yeah. would you do if you do have an external client and you have a date? So if you know me, I like, I'm a trickster at heart. <laughs> so uh, I would go and engage with traditional people by opening the conversation by taking a bet. Because traditional folks uh, look at me as that agile guy that shows up, right? So I need to have a warm and interesting way of 
opening a conversation with new people and taking bets was my easiest way. Yeah. Now, what I never did was went in the meeting and shared this with everyone in public, but as we talked to most people, I uh, planted the seeds of recognizing that something's not right with our red, green, yellow PMO style meetings and building a case for visualization one person at a time, whoever wanted to listen to me, rather than pulling a big meeting and saying, we're going to do this. In, in other words, I, per, I genuinely believe that 90% of any meeting outcome is decided outside the meeting before the meeting even happens. So if you don't control that, then the meeting is just a waste of everybody's time, right? So by the time we were there to work on the visualization, I knew that there is enough buy-in individually. I just have to have a mechanism to show that everyone else is supporting this idea. Does that make sense? Sometimes it's as simple as just asking the question, well, why, why do you feel that way? And you may gain insight into not necessarily anything internal to that person's feelings, but they may feel something about somebody else. And that allows, gives you insight into other information that you may not have at your disposal, but it'll, it gives you that trigger to do more research. mentioned you uh, spend about two to three days a month. Um, did you start out that way or you started with a more intensive? Uh, how did you structure the engagement? I'm just curious. Right. Um, so when we started, uh, we had initial heavy engagement for a while. And uh, I had another coach with me, but that fellow was working mostly with the teams at Shelter. My engagement was, was the direct program. and. It started heavy at first, and then it went to two or three days every month. And at another set of times when we kicked off a new bunch of teams, again, it spiked up a bit for the purposes of new teams that are not related to the direct program, but general teams that wanted to do Agile now. So for that purposes, and uh, yeah, so it's been mostly spikes, but typically uh, like a flat line in terms of, because Columbia, Missouri is not easy to get to. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, Davil definitely came in, showed us the ins and outs and options available, and then he would give us homework and say, I'm going to come back and grade your homework later. Show me what you got. Show me your work. It was, it was mostly the, you were in danger of losing my respect. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Well, thank you.